Okay, so let's continue. Now, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Sinai Hobbins uh, uh, from the University of Sao Paulo. And he'll be talking about multi-tilings and the geometry of numbers in the bombieri Siegel's approach. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you, Felipe. Uh, it's great to be back here. It's always fun to be back here. And uh, I've traveled many countries, I think over 40 countries, and this is one of the nicest mathematical institutions I've ever seen. Uh, it's always uh, very friendly. And so uh, for today, um, the topic is, is a little bit mixed. This is joint, I should say, with my uh, recent PhD student. Michel just finished his PhD with me at USP. And uh, we studied, uh, we started with uh, this bombieri Ziegel approach, which I'll, I'll introduce uh, gently. So the first half of the talk will be uh, more or less, this is Michel, more or less like basic harmonic analysis mixed with number theory. And so uh, you shouldn't be too impressed. What the more interesting stuff is the later stuff, uh, the second half of the talk, which is more, what, what do we do with it? What do we do with these techniques? So, uh, but a bit of the history. So uh, the geometry of numbers started with Minkowski. Minkowski around 1895. And many people continued. One of the people was, of course, Carl Ludwig Siegel. Uh, and Carl Ludwig Siegel pushed it uh, uh, much further, but uh, many, many things always go back to Minkowski still. So Siegel's formula is the following from 1935. Uh, going back to Minkowski again, the, the idea of a body, first, what's a body, just a language? A body is any compact subset of Euclidean space. So. Instead of saying compact subset of Euclidean space, we just say a body. And given a convex body and a full rank lattice, L is always assumed to be full rank, so the same dimension as the ambient space. If the only lattice point of L in the interior of the difference body, the same as, uh, as Gugu, Gugu talked about, here we put a one half, we dilate by one half, so you shrink the body by a factor of a half first, and this is called Minkowski symmetrization. And so if you do this, if the only inter, uh, lattice point in the interior is the origin, then we have the following uh, formula due to Siegel, Carl Ludwig Siegel. And an immediate corollary is Minkowski's formula, which says, so I should remind you, so Minkowski, Minkowski's first theorem said that if, uh, the only uh, lattice point, the same condition, the, last point, um, the same condition of, of Siegel, Carl Ludwig Siegel, um, If the origin is the only uh, lattice point in, in 1 half p minus 1 half p, then, uh, then Minkowski said that 2 to the d times the determinant of the lattice is uh, greater than or equal to the volume. So this is Minkowski's first theorem back in the late 1800s, beginning in 1900s. And uh, there's kind of a um, jitado, there's a kind of a saying, whenever you see an inequality, it's always interesting to, to see when equality happens. So what are the error terms? So, this, so if you look at Minkowski carefully, you, if it's greater than or equal to, then what is, what is the error term? Can you give a precise? If it's greater than or equal to for every, for every convex body, what is the error term in terms of the convex body and the lattice? And so the error term was given explicitly by Siegel, and it's exactly this uh, series over the dual lattice uh, of using the Fourier transform. So very, natural, very naturally uh, come in the Fourier transforms of the bodies into, into the picture in giving the error term to Minkowski's uh, first 
theorem. So a lot of this, so we want to motivate this by introducing uh, more general identities than Siegel, and then saying, okay, now there's an inequality, uh, or rather, so now we're going to go backwards. We're going to generalize this a little bit, and then say, um, what are, what, what's an inequality that we can get? And there's a very easy inequality using the same idea. And so Siegel implies Minkowski in one, in one second, right? But now we can say, can we characterize the bodies which give the equality case? So those bodies classically which give the equality case, um, as we'll, as we'll uh, see in a second, are characterized by something called tiling and multi-tiling space by translations of the body. So, Sorry? One stands for, for cartesian function, for vertical function of the cell. Yes, yes, so, so right, sorry. So the one, right, thank you. Thanks for asking. So the one is always the indicator function. So by definition, one or zero. Right, so it's the indicator function, which is clearly discontinuous on Euclidean space. So generally, when, when we, we all use the same similar techniques, I think, was on summation or Plancherel, when you do these things, you smooth the indicator function by either a Gaussian or itself or something to make it continuous. Uh, let's see. Right, so Siegel's original proof, in fact, uses the Parseval identity. To, here, we're going to use Poisson summation, uh, some version of Poisson summation, which I'll talk about. And uh, luckily, Gugut already talked about the uh, the difference body, which is so important in many things. So uh, P, if P is essentially symmetric, it's an exercise, basic exercise in the geometry of numbers that for undergraduates that uh, one half P minus one half P equals P if and only if P is convex and essentially symmetric. So uh, by the way, in the classic book of uh, the geometry of numbers by Castles, Castles writes that Siegel is given a, a stronger form of Minkowski or Blichfeld, which has, however, remained rather sterile of applications. So I, it's, it's a kind of a, uh, a ding. At, uh, they must have known each other and been friends, probably. But we want to change this. Uh, we want to change this now and give some applications. So uh, right. So what's Minkowski's first theorem says? We said here Minkowski's first theorem uh, says that uh, you have this conclusion Assuming the same hypotheses as Carl Ludwig Siegel, in applications, in many applications in number theory, you, and there are many, many applications of this, you, sometimes we use the contrapositive. So you have this inequality, we have this inequality where the error term is strictly, well, positive or zero. And the contrapositive says that if the volume is greater than, strictly greater than this number, then there exists a non-trivial, a non-zero integer point. And that existence of a non-zero integer point gives you sometimes, often, solutions to some difficult Diophantine equation. Maybe sometimes not so difficult. So for example, every prime that's coming to one mod four is a sum of two squares. Every, every positive integer is a sum of four squares. These follow from this theorem. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's the philosophy. So, so the proof follows in one line, of course, but then uh, it's interesting, it lay dormant for many years because we, in general, we don't know how to compute, uh, let's see, in general, we don't know how to compute these uh, Fourier transforms, right? So these Fourier transforms for a general convex body are hard to compute, but for polytopes, now we have machinery. We know how to compute these for polytopes. This machinery that's developed over the last 20 years. Uh, and so we, now we know we have a very nice machinery to compute it for polytopes. So let's see. Uh, right. So can we characterize the cases of equality? For which bodies do we have equality? In the literature, these are known for a long time as extremal bodies. The extremal bodies are the cases of equality. And it's also known in literature that these happen, the, the, the extremal bodies, the cases of equality in Minkowski happen if and only if the body tiles Euclidean space by translations uh, or multi-tiles. We'll, we'll talk about multi-tiling, but the um, 
classically for crystallography, crystallography developed uh, along the similar lines that the body tiles with a fixed lattice if and only if um, something nice happens. So if and only if what? So it's very interesting here. There's a, there's a lemma of Kolonzagis that says that uh, one, one half times the body tiles by translations uh, with, uh, with L if and only if the Fourier transform vanishes for all C in the dual lattice to L. So this is a very nice dictionary between tiling using a convex body to tile Euclidean space by translations with a lattice L, if and only if some vanishing happens in the dual space, in other words, in the transform space. So this lemma is, in fact, very easy to prove, but it's very, very useful. The, the proof follows in one paragraph from Poisson summation, but the question is how to use it. It's very, very useful. And so it, it tells you immediately, it tells us immediately that some nice geometry happens with, uh, you know, uh, symmetric, symmetric hexagon styling by translations, etc. cetera, if and only if the Fourier transform of this body vanishes on the dual lattice to the lattice of translations. So the lattice of translations is going to be the lattice generated by these two vectors. You look at the dual lattice, and uh, where the transform vanishes precisely gives you information about tiling. So we want to develop this dictionary further, and a lot of my current research is kind of circling around what kind, what, what kind of information can you gain from the zero set of the Fourier transform uh, geometrically. So what is the zero? Already we see that the zero set of the Fourier transform tells you something very, very nice and simple geometrically. What else can you gain from it, the zero set? And all the are Sorry? All are uh, no, so far, no. They don't have to be. No. Later on, yes, but right now they don't have to be. Oh, so by the way, thank you for asking. So it's a general fact that's not so hard to show that if you have a convex body that does tile by translations only, it must be a polytope. It doesn't have to be an integer polytope, but it must be a polytope. That's not hard to show. In convex, polytope is for convex. Right, so if you, if you start with any convex body and you say it, it tiles by translations with a fixed lattice or even a finite union of lattices, then it's a fact that that convex body must be a polytope. And what's the polytope? Sorry? What's the Oh, a uh, convex body could be a circle, for example, okay. or an ellipse. But a polytope is locally flat, piecewise linear. So uh, quickly, part two, the covariogram. Uh, this is, uh, again, Google talked about similar things. This is a kind of a statistical approach, but it's a very well-known approach. The, given a convex body uh, K, for example, a, a ball, you, you look at k intersect k plus x for all x, and this is called the covariogram. Sometimes it's called the autocorrelation. And if you know this, if you know this for all x, can, uh, there's a conjecture due to Materon, which is now largely proved. Can you recover uniquely the body x? And the answer is sort of yes, sort of, and for, for convex things. And uh, so, right, so the covariogram, which is by definition this, it's geometric, but again, it's a very easy exercise to show that this function, uh, which measures the volume of the intersection of k with, uh, after you translate by any vector x, is exactly this integral. So this is very easy, and uh, it's called, sometimes it's called set covariance, sometimes autocorrelation, and sometimes covariogram. In Bianchi's papers, this guy who kind of largely proved it, Averkov and Bianchi, in their papers, they call it uh, they call it the covariogram. So, so far, so good. Any questions so far? So this is kind of this is a, so far very straightforward. And you can do the same thing if you replace uh, instead of k and k, you, you you take any two compact subsets, any two bodies, k and l. The same thing works. So you have obviously, and everything works the same way. You have the convolution of the two functions. And so the idea is to apply, uh, one, one idea is to apply Poisson summation to the convolution. You could also use Plancherel, but let's apply Poisson summation to the convolution and see what happens. So, uh, so part three, let's see. Part three was, starts with Bambieri. 
1962, Bambieri is 22 years old, and he proves the following. So let's see. He proves that if you, uh, if you now look at the theorem of Carl Ludwig Siegel, remember the hypothesis was that the only lattice point inside the difference body should be the origin. So now remove the hypothesis completely and allow any, any convex body, Q, uh, compact. Uh, in fact, it doesn't have to be convex anymore here. Yeah, just compact, anybody. And let L be a, a full rank lattice. Then you have this extension of Minkowski. So this extends in a nice way, in a very direct way, Minkowski. And if you do have the hypothesis uh, that the only in lattice point uh, is the origin, then this left-hand side reduces to, to this left-hand side. Uh, let's see. So let me put up again. Let me go back. So this is Bambieri's um, extension of Siegel. So let's call the, the Bambieri-Siegel approach this, this approach of using this as a starting point. So everything up until here is, is fairly straightforward harmonic analysis, pretty straightforward. Now the, point, the question is, what, what do we do with this tool? How do we use it? So, uh, so this is very nice, I think, and extends Siegel in a very nice way. Uh, Bambieri used it to approach something called the Minkowski conjecture on products of linear forms over the reals, whether there exists an integer point that gives you a, a nice upper bound on, on, the, on the product of linear forms. But for here, let's use it for something else. And this is the Materon conjecture we mentioned, whether the covariogram uniquely determines the body. It's sort of, oops, it's sort of, uh, let, me, let me see. I'm beginning. So it's sort of done. Uh, by now, it's largely proved by Averkov and Bianchi. I won't get into the literature because it's scattered over many, many papers, over many years, many partial results, and some for non-convex, some for convex. But uh, there are counterexamples for non-convex things, and then for convex things, it's largely true. But let me, uh, if, you, if you're curious, there's a nice survey paper about, it, about a year ago, two years ago, by Averkov and Bianchi that gives you the, the state of affairs. There's some still open things, but largely done. So let's see. So now, uh, oh, so this is just to be called the definition of the Fourier transform. I'm going to, uh, let's see, this, yeah, so I'm using this definition of the Fourier transform, the same definition probably all of you use, but sometimes people use, the, they put the two pies somewhere else. I just wanted to get the definition straight. Uh, and let's see. Let me go to, uh, to part four, right, a variation of Poisson summation. So let's see. This, how does this? Let's see. OK, so given any, given any uh, let's say, compact set K, the Poisson summation formula uh, holds, if it holds for the convolution of the indicator function of K, convolved with the indicator function of minus k, we'll call k an admissible set or a nice set, and f will be called an admissible function or a nice function. And the, let's see, uh, these theorems are going to be fairly straightforward. None of these results, I think, are too surprising from a harmonic analysis perspective, but again, the applications will be more interesting. So. If you have two compact sets, A and B, such that they're both in, both in L1 and in L2, and such that they're both um, bounded functions, F is compactly supported on A and G is compactly supported on B, then for any function, uh, for any, um, then you have the following. Uh, the convolution is an admissible function and also continuous. You have this, um, we have this uh, Poisson summation formula for the convolution. And more interestingly, we have uh, this, this three, which extends a little bit Bambieri. It's not a big extension. It's a very tiny epsilon extension. But later, a, a more interesting extension will be exactly what do we sum over in this finite sum. It's a finite sum because A and B are compact. So after some sufficiently large, uh, uh, that, uh, sufficiently large n, 
uh, the, the end will take you away from, from uh, intersecting it uh, A and B. But, so, it's, so it's finite. The left-hand side is a finite sum, but finite over exactly what's set. So we'll, we'll give a, a precise um, description over the, the index of summation uh, here in N. Uh, so far, so good? Again, this is a basic harmonic analysis, but uh, maybe kind of cute. Uh, the Poisson summation formula that we use, uh, um, uh, I think we're all very fond of Poisson summation, it, but this was a little bit different that it holds for a function f which is uh, compactly supported, continuous, and such that its Fourier transform is L1. OK. Let's see. OK, so consequences. So I think this part is more interesting. Uh, how, what do we do with these tools? So now let me give you the definition of a tiling or multi-tiling. So suppose you have a convex body, and you translate it with a fixed lattice L, and you want uh, every point x, you want every point x to be covered by exactly, uh, you want every point x to be covered exactly k times for a fixed uh, positive integer k. So you fix, uh, you fix k, k is a constant, and you, you vary over some lattice, L. So if for every x there exist exactly n different translates of your body that cover x, then uh, this exact covering, or in other words, multi-tiling, is, uh, it's called, uh, yeah, so p is said to multi-tile uh, or, or k-tile. So here p is said to k-tile. PK tiles. It K tiles the space if this is true for almost all X. Obviously, it's false for X in a boundary of P or translates of the boundary, but it's true for almost all X. And if this is true, if P is convex, then it's again a theorem. It's a small lemma that it must be a polytope. So this is multi-tiling, the definition of multi-tiling. And by, if, you know, if you're fond of Poisson summation, as, as we all are, I think, then you know that this is very close to the lemma that I wrote before. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, by the way, so when k equals 1, this is the classical definition of tiling. Every point gets covered once. When k equals 2, it's a conjecture. It's an open problem. Uh, whether there exists a two-tiling in arbitrary dimension that is not trivial. So I would conjecture, and um, there's a conjecture by uh, some uh, very interesting Chinese mathematicians recently, uh, Zhang Chuanming and his PhD students, that uh, this is impossible unless it's a trivial, it's a trivial um, k-tiling. What is a trivial k-tiling? If, if you have a two-tiling that really comes from a one-tiling, in other words, if you have a two-tiling such that there exists also some, perhaps some other lattice which gives you a one-tiling, we'll call it a trivial two-tiling. So the, the, the body also ex, uh, admits a one-tiling, then it's trivial. Uh, I w there, it's an open problem whether there are non-trivial uh, two-tilings. Uh, kind of a curious open problem. I would, I would guess that there aren't. Everything is trivial. Uh, you can prove that every, the two tilings, there are, there are no non-trivial two tilings in dimension two and three, but in dimension four and higher, it's still open. So the smallest k for which there's a non-trivial k tiling is, is kind of, an, in general, an open problem, which is interesting. So, the definition of, 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 of the k tiling, do you require like, each point to be covered by exactly k, k tiles or, or k or, my, or, or less? Each point in the interior of p and its translates. Yes, exactly. Each point in the interior of P and it translates. And you know the boundary. We don't care about the boundary. And, and for one tiling also, you don't care about the well, the, because if you have a square and, and the, one, the edge of the square will meet itself, so a point on the boundary will be covered several times. So the same for the classical tiling. You don't care about the boundary. Yeah. So for one tile, uh, if it tiles, there must be some conditions on how it tiles, like it's face to face or 
do you know any conditions like that? For instance, like that one is face to face. The faces are not like translated Yeah, so that's a good question. So Minkowski proved that, yeah, Minkowski proved that it, it um, actually you're, you're, um, you're bringing up a, a kind of a delicate conjecture. There's the twin cube conjecture of Minkowski. Uh, but uh, if it, but if it, if it tiles, okay, so, so now there's two different fields. The one, there's a field where you insist on tiling with a lattice. And one, there's a field where you insist on tiling with any discrete set of vectors which is, has no structure. Mm -hmm. If you insist on tiling with a lattice, you can show that it's face to face in any dimension. If you don't insist on tiling with a lattice, but a finite union of lattices or arbitrary discrete sets, um, uniformly discrete sets, then yeah, almost, I suppose anything could happen. And we don't know. And that bifurcation into these two fields happened uh, early on in the 1920s. And Hayosh, this Hungarian mathematician, finally proved this famous Minkowski conjecture on the twin cube problem, which is if you, ha if you take the cube and you tile with any discrete set, is it true that the facets must, that there must be at least two of them that share a facet? And that remained open for many years until Hayosh proved it finally in the 60s, I think, for, for uh, yeah. No, but okay. suppose it's a lattice, it's suppose it's a two tile. Is there any other conditions on how it may tile? Uh, let's see. So I don't want to say anything false, so let me say I'm almost sure that it, it's gotta it's gotta be face to face, but for multi tilings, but uh, I have to be a little bit careful, but uh, I'm almost sure, but I'm not I, I don't recall the exact reference. Yeah, but these are very delicate theorems, right? You replace your indicator function by some other function f. Is some closed indicator is a small bit that fixes it. Uh, of what Felipe is asking, you mean? Or? No, but I mean, just the, the k tile in the language, some approximation. Yes. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very nice question. So it is. So a generalization of k tilings, instead of the indicator function, if you replace it by, by um, a, a nice function f, where you define nice to be L1 or something, or some other properties, then, then it's, uh, it's called k-tiling with a function. Uh, f and there is, there is some theory on the zero set of the Fourier transform. So the zero set of the Fourier transform of f will tell you something about it as well. Um, right, and, and, or some people might call it weak weak forms of tiling, and then if you go from weak to, to strong, that's one direction people have taken, yes. It's developed. The Mihalis Kolonzagas developed it, uh, and then uh, other people since. We'll simply use uh, the indicator function because it's the simplest, yeah. But that's a good point, yeah. So for K, right, so, uh, so the field kind of exploded over the last 20 years. Mihalis Kolonzagas, who we gave the first lemma, started this in the year 2001 with a paper in two dimensions, and he used the technique of um, um, well, uh, yeah. Let, let me let me go on. Uh, there's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, technique that he used. But let me, let me keep going for the moment. So let's see. So here's an example of a non-convex, um, let's see, non-convex uh, polygon that multi-tiles with k equals 2. And so if you take the, the polygon on the left is obviously non-convex. If you translate it, in this case, with the so-called checkerboard lattice, or the D2 lattice, uh, uh, which, is, which means the lattice of uh, integer points such as, such as the sum of the coordinates is even, then you get, uh, you get a, a multi-tiling, a two-tiling in this case. It's a perfect two-tiling. And the body on the right is Q minus Q. So, so if this body, let's see, the body on the left is Q, the body on the right is the difference set. As you can see, when you start taking Q minus Q, one thing that happens is it gets bigger. Another thing that happens, it kind of becomes more and more um, symmetric. And in the limit, if you iterate the symmetrization with a factor of one half in front of the Q, uh, it turns out it's not a difficult thing. It's an exercise to show that in limit, you, you approach a, 
uh, a convex body. So, so far, so good. So, so this is a nice example. Here's a picture of what literally happens when you translate this non-convex body uh, by a lattice, the, the checkerboard lattice in particular. And uh, this is an example where k equals 2 works. It's a non-trivial non tiling. You can prove that this body does not admit a one tiling with any lattice. It's easy to prove by contradiction. But uh, this works because it's a non-convex body. The conjecture we mentioned is that 2 is, doesn't exist as a non-trivial multi-tiling only works for convex bodies. This is a non-convex body. So for non-convex bodies, things are more tricky. So let's go back and get a corollary of our, um, uh, of, our of the Ziegel-Bambieri result. So we want to extend a little bit in, uh, remember we said we want, to, we want to see where, which integer points we must sum over on the left side. It turns out you look at the interior of the difference body, exactly the same thing that came up in Google's lecture. The interior of the difference body uh, controls exactly the, the places where this is non-zero. So, and that's a technical lemma. You, uh, it's not trivial to prove, but it's a technical lemma that holds if the body is compact. And so, uh, let's see, so we get a lower bound. So this lower bound corresponds roughly to Minkowski's lower bound, but now you don't need this hypothesis anymore. And Minkowski, just like in Minkowski, it was true classically. Uh, it was known by Lavka. I think Lavka proved it first many years ago. Lavka proved that you have equality if and only if the body translates, uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a tile. Tiles Euclidean space by translations with a lattice. Here, you can ask the same question. Uh, which bodies achieve the equality case? So it turns out here we proved recently that they achieve the equality case if and only if the body Q multi-tiles, uh, multi-tiles for some K. And it turns out that uh, you, can sh you can show that K, by definition, is the volume of the body divided by the determinant of the lattice. It has to be, you can show that it has to be that. That's not hard to show. Let's see. So, right. So by analogy with Minkowski, we want to ask, you have a bunch of new equalities, and when do you achieve equality? Can you characterize all the bodies which achieve equality? And let's see. I think this, yeah. So, so you get equality, it turns out, if and only if uh, the body k tiles uh, with, uh, with L. Sorry, there's a, there's, a, there's a typo. K tiles with the dual lattice, I'm sorry. K tiles with the dual lattice. The dual lattice. Uh, just for the sake of, um, it's a set of all points in Euclidean space such that the inner product so the inner product uh, with everything in the lattice is an integer. So this is, this is uh, what comes up naturally from Poisson summation, the dual lattice. And so, uh, so this should be the dual lattice uh, here. Whoops. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it multitiles with the dual lattice translations by the, the points from the dual lattice, even only if uh, equality holds. And so, going back to the nice example with k equals two for this non-convex body, uh, we want to. We want to plug in now the integer points. If you look at the integer points that belong to Q minus Q, these green points, there are nine green points. These nine green points exactly are the points on the left-hand side of the sum of the covariogram gram over the lattice. So these are the green points. These nine green points are, are control now what's happening uh, in, in that identity, in the inequality. And in this case, the inequality will become exact an exact equality. So let's see. I'm not sure why it's uh, maybe the battery. OK. And again, this is the picture again. I'm only point, putting the picture twice because it took me four hours to, to paint it. So <laughs> it's fine. OK, so now let's, let's continue. Uh, oh, by the way, there's more, yeah, there's more corollaries. So this is another corollary of this technique. Um, the, 
Let's see. So this corollary gives you a new formula for the square of the volume of a compact set in terms of the right-hand side, assuming that sufficiently that if you take a compact set Q, compact body Q, doesn't have to be convex, such that uh, there's a sparse lattice such that when you translate it by the lattice uh, vectors, it doesn't intersect itself, nor does it intersect uh, itself when you translate by X. So for any X, um, you translate Q by X, Q plus X, and you also translate Q plus X by L, so Q plus X plus L, little l in the lattice, and all of those translates will be mutually disjoint. Then you have this formula. This is not maybe, the right-hand side is, again, um, maybe too difficult in general, but the more interesting thing, I think, is an, an extension of this to two compact sets, this product formula. So this product formula for the volume of two, the volume of two bodies, I think it's, it's similar, but it's more interesting because I, I think this might have more applications. I'm trying to use this. For example, there's a, there's a famous open problem, um, Mahler, Mahler's conjecture. Mahler's conjecture for the product of the volume of A with the volume of the dual of A, when A is a convex body containing the origin, let's say. So the, the product formula is bounded from below by some nice constant. It's still an open problem, very famous conjecture of Mahler, Kurt Mahler. And I was trying to use this to, to, to say something about it. But again, these computations, we know how to compute these things for polytopes. So if you put a simplex here, if A is a simplex and B is a dual simplex, then these have closed forms, but it's a mess, right? So you have to, you have to deal with this mess somehow on the right-hand side. Okay. So now, uh, even more interesting than this, I think, is a discretization of the whole process. So let me briefly talk about the discretization. So part four is, uh, yeah, it's, uh, right. right, so here's, so discrete setting, so how do you discretize the Ziegel-Bombieri formula now? What does it mean to discretize it? So instead of looking at compact sets Q, we want to look at finite sets Q. Q is a, fi a finite set of integer points in space, let's say. So you take, uh, you're sitting in dimension D, and you're looking at some finite, arbitrary finite set of integer points, and you want to know whether it tiles the space, the, in this case, the lattice, whether it tiles the, the integer lattice by translations with some discrete set of vectors. So let's see what, uh, what's possible so far. So F is now any finite set of integer points, so the Q becomes F. We're gonna thicken up the integer points by putting a square centered around each integer point. Okay, so center a little epsilon square. And now this epsilon thickening, we'll call it an epsilon thickening, it has a positive measure, so we can take transforms on the right-hand side. And we do that, and it doesn't really matter for this picture if you epsilon thicken it by spheres or cubes. Uh, cubes have a nice Fourier transform, so do spheres, J Bessel functions, but cubes are kind of even nicer in some sense, so we, we used cubes. And now we'll look at the, uh, let A be the union of these cubes, and let epsilon be strictly between zero and one, then uh, the cubes don't intersect themselves because the cubes are centered at these integer points that belong to the finite set F, and now you can apply these techniques to this thickened uh, finite set of integer points, and so, uh, for, so here you have uh, nine integer points, the square, uh, the square point, the, the, um, the circles, the black circles, you start, that's F. And now we want to know, given F, does it uh, unique, does it exactly tile the integer lattice by translations with some discrete set of vectors belonging to the integer lattice, of course, but. And for this, it's not obvious in general, but for this you can, for this it does. And we want to get similar inequalities and to study the equality case. And so using these techniques, uh, let's see. So what is, the discrete, what, what is our discretized bombieri Ziegel formula? You take a finite set, F, you thicken it, you apply the technique, the, uh, or the, this kind of extended bombieri Ziegel formula to this thickened set, and now, this is for a fixed epsilon. And now on the left-hand side, after the smoke clears, you get exactly this finite sum, and everything is an integer now except epsilon. 
So everything, uh, the size of these sets are integers. And so you have a, a bunch of um, integer points, and you sum these uh, discrete um, autocorrelations, and you get this formula. And on the right-hand side, you get, the, remember, A is the thickened, the thickened finite set of integer points, but you take the transform. And now, because it's a cube, the Fourier transform has a nice formula as, as a product of sync functions. And so you can, you can sort of do a little bit more. And so after, again, after the smoke clears, uh, let's see. You, you want to, let's see. Right, so now you have this formula, the, the analog of, of uh, Ziegel. And by the way, I think there's a typo here. One of these epsilons in this, is in the wrong place. Okay, so there's a typo with the epsilons, never mind. But it's essentially that formula. And now you want to apply this formula uh, to tell you something about uh, any finite set of integer points uh, tiling or multi-tiling the integer lattice by some uh, lattice of translation vectors. So if you notice the right-hand side, again, these are all non-negative. They could be zero, but in general, they're non-negative. So trivially, the left-hand side the left-hand side is greater than or equal to this uh, zero term. This is the zero term of the sum. We took out the zero term. It's like the volume. So this is the volume. It's the zero term. And so if, you, if this Fourier transform vanishes identically for every C in the dual lattice, you just get equality. You get that this is equal to this. So you get a universal inequality with equality if and only if these Fourier transforms vanish for every C in the dual lattice. And so, uh, right, so you get these, uh, oops. So you get this corollary, let me go back to, so you get this corollary that the left-hand side of this discretized bombier eagle is greater than or equal to this factor. And the, the analog, the analogous k for these discrete, now, now p is a finite set in this discretized case, the, analo the analog of k is the number of points, the number of integer points in f. So that's the analog. k necessarily has to be that. So the k is hiding in the right-hand side it's really k times the size of f. And so again, what are the extremal bodies? In other words, what are the finite sets of integer points f that achieve equality? And as you can guess now by analogy, it's true that it's going to be exactly those finite sets of points f that multi-tile by translations with the dual lattice. Uh, sorry, with the, with the lattice, because we're doing the integer lattice. The, inter the dual of the integer lattice is the, is the integer lattice. So, right, so, so that's what happens. So we have this, uh, we get these uh, three equivalent conditions. Let's see. We get these three equivalent conditions that starting with any finite set of integer points f, it multi-tiles the integer lattice with some proper integer sub-lattice if and only if uh, any of these three conditions hold. This condition is what we saw before, analogous to what we saw before, but now f is a finite set. This condition is, is the definition of uh, multi-tiling uh, by translations with L. And this is a character, a vanishing sums of characters condition. So, uh, so uh, remember that you have a finite index, uh, you have a finite, L is going to be a finite index sub-lattice of the integer lattice. And so uh, the dual lattice has some, basically some rational, it's a rational matrix image of the integer lattice and it has a fixed denominator, that denominator comes into these Xs, and you have, these are really roots of unity. So it's a vanishing sums of roots of unity. And so these are the three equivalent conditions that we get for finite sets of integer points, uh, tiling or multi-tiling, the lattice. Uh, so I, I really like this, except uh, I should tell you the pit, I should tell you what, what's, uh, what it doesn't say also. So we're, we're reached the end of this talk, but what it doesn't tell me and what I'm really curious about is which Ls, if you give me a finite set of integer points, let's say those nine points, or you give me a million integer points in dimension, even in dimension two, you give me some, a million integer points scattered, how do I know which lattice to use to check if this tiles the, the two-dimensional integer lattice or not? This doesn't tell you it tells you if you, have a, if you have a candidate lattice, then you can check any of these conditions. But how do, you, how do you discover the lattice which it should, even if somebody tells you, okay, here are a million integer points in dimension two, I'm, tell, I'm gonna tell you that there exists a lattice. How do you know it exists? I don't know. It doesn't tell you how to find a lattice. 
So that's another uh, direction which I think would be very interesting. Okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, let me kind of finish there. So further directions, uh, this is a conjecture that I just made recently uh, about the zero, it has to, it's related to the zero set of the Fourier transform of the body, but let me skip this conjecture for now. Uh, this is the K equals two conjecture we mentioned before that for convex bodies, now compact sets, compact sets Q, it's an open problem whether there exists a non-trivial two tiling uh, above dimension three. Uh, also, yeah, Matheron's conjecture is largely proved. Another thing is uh, you, can, you can easily show, you can easily show uh, if you start with uh, this, the, the Minkowski Ziegel formula, sorry, the Bambieri Ziegel formula, you can easily show that you get uh, the closed forms for the Riemann zeta function at even values. That follows easily from that formula. How you can pick uh, some very simple uh, bodies like a triangle, take a, a nice triangle in, in, uh, or a simplex, integer simplex in dimension D, you brute force compute the Fourier transform on the right hand side, and you get the sum of Riemann zeta values very quickly. So, but you get the sum of Riemann zeta values at the even integers because you get norm squares. Remember, you get the sum of norm squares in the Riemann Ziegel formula on the right hand side. Those, no, those squares give you the Riemann zeta function at even integers because of the squares. Uh, an interesting question is can you get the Riemann zeta values at the odd integers by maybe taking non convex things, non convex bodies, taking their Fourier transform? Maybe the squares will cancel magically and you get the, so it would be very interesting to try to recover formulas for, for the odd zeta values by perhaps taking non-convex uh, bodies in D dimensions. Okay, let me, so let me finish there. Uh, right, 